pride promotes strife. Everyone knows pride is not a good thing, right? That's how Satan fell. He got prideful. He wanted to be worshipped. And he was thrown from heaven. And now he's here tormenting us. And so Jesus comes back again. Amen? So I just want to bow our heads and say a prayer. Father God, thank you for your living word that can change us from the inside out, Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross and, and giving us your living word to wash us clean and give us a new heart. Put it, take our heart of stone out of us and put it in a new heart, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. And we pray you'd speak to us now through your word in James 4, Lord. And I give you praise in the almighty name of Jesus. So we're in James chapter 4. Verse 1 goes like this. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? And the God's Word translation says, Your selfish desires that fight to control you. You see, there's a war going on in all of us between good and evil. And since we're all made in God's image, He has given us all a conscience or ability to sense right from wrong. One difference between a true believer and a non-believer is how the indwelling of the Holy Spirit strengthens the sense of morality in the believer, causing them not to be sinless, no one's perfect, but to sin much less than they did before. Amen. The Bible promises that the work Jesus has started in those who have accepted Jesus' payment on the cross for their sins will someday be completed, and then they will be like Jesus. And I have a scripture that supports that. Some of you probably know it. Philippians 1.6 And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue His work until it's finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Now back to James 4, verse 2. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. In the New Living Testament it says, You want what you don't have. You scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. This is a great example of how through our fallen nature we are prone to have lust and greed, right? You don't have to teach a little baby that's barely walking to take a toy and say, Mine! not share it, right? That comes naturally. Verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. God's no genie to ask whatever we desire just because we invoke His Son's name, right? But what we ask must be aligned with God's will as well. Psalm 37, 4, it says, in the New American Standard, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. He just doesn't say, speak my son's name and I'll give you whatever you want. He says, delight yourself in me. Right? And you're going to be aligned with God's will. Then He'll give you what you want because you're aligned with what God wants too. The New, uh, English, test, uh, New English Translation says, take delight in the Lord and He will answer your prayers. That's how you get your prayers answered, right? This is a life verse of mine. Verse uh, Matthew 6.33 goes along with this. This is the New Living Testament. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. You see, there's a catch to it though. You've got to live righteously to the best of your ability. No, you don't have to be perfect, but God will help you live better than you did before. Right? Amen? So we see we need to be aligned with God's plan for Him to answer all of our prayers and we should not try to name it and claim it like many of the common false teachings. Back to James 4.4. 4. Uh, James says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. John 15.9 says, The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you will no longer are part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. I think the world hating me or you for being a Christian is a small price to pay for eternal life instead of eternal darkness. But we do have to count the cost before we accept Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. Verse 5. 
Back in James 4. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? So if we're a believer and God's spirit is in us, it wants us to be aligned with him, right? That's what it means by jealous. He loves us. He doesn't want things that are bad for us. Verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, right? Uh, I'm going to read verse 5 and 6 in the New Living Translation. It says, What do you think the scriptures mean when they say the Spirit of God has placed within us is filled with envy? But he gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires. So when you get aligned with him, he'll help you from lusting and having greed. Because his Spirit directs us, right? If we submit ourselves to what Jesus did on the cross. And in our translation I used here, uh, the New King James, the, the next uh, part of the chapter is called Humility Cures Worldliness. Verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the evil day comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So God's not going to draw near to us if we don't do something, right? You can't just sit there and hope that He comes to you. You have to knock for the door to be opened, Jesus said, right? Verse 8, draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now how do we put on God's full armor? How do we draw near to Him? How do we purify our hearts, right? We must wash ourselves in the water of the living Word of God every day with prayer and God will do it in us. That's all you got to do is pick up His Word and believe it, read it, abide in it. It'll change you. You keep reading it, keep putting good things in, good things will come out. You keep putting yourself around filth, looking at some of the stuff that's on TV and movies. You put disgusting things in your mind and your body. That's what comes back out, right? You got to put in good to get good back. Verse 9. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. I just read verse 6 and 7. It says God resists the proud, right? But what does He give to the humble? He gives grace, right? Therefore submit to God, resist the devil and He'll flee from you. I wanted to read that again. If you resist him, he'll flee from you. If you go along with what the world wants, he'll, he'll, he'll jump in your party and stay with you. He'll lead you right to hell. But if you resist him, he will flee. He doesn't want to be around someone that's like Jesus. That makes him disgusted. The point of getting rid of pride and humbling yourself is that you must realize you're a sinner who needs a saving. Who needs saving before it makes sense to let Jesus pay for your sins with his own life. So like the scriptures advise... Submit to God so He can lift you up by letting His only Son, Jesus, pay for your sins with His blood, with His life. Do not judge another brother. That's what it says in the translation I was reading. The next part says, don't judge another brother. It's not our job to judge people. Verse 11, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but you're a judge. And the New Living sheds more, life, li um, sheds more light on this verse. It says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging, judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you, there is one lawgiver and who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Do not boast about tomorrow. Come now. You who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow, will go in such and such a city and spend a year there. Buy and sell and make a profit. Verse 14. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. You can't take tomorrow for granted. For what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. I don't like arrogant people. Do you guys like people that are arrogant all full of themselves? 
That's why I don't really, there's so many people that like Trump. I really don't like him. He is full of himself. It's coming out of his ears. That's why I don't trust him. Arrogance is, comes from evil. It doesn't come from good. Um, since 10 out of 10 people have an appointment with the Reaper, or Dr. Kevorkian, right? All of us are going to see Dr. Kevorkian someday. Death. None of us know how soon that'll be. So we ought to live life to make a difference. Yeah. Make our lives count for something. Amen? So and if you want to do that, I'm going to give you another chance. Like we did in the last message. If you want to give your life to Jesus, He gave His life for you already. All you got to do is take that expensive gift that's free to you. It's easy for us. Look how much it costs God. How much it cost Jesus. They gave His life. He suffered so we could be with Him forever. And I'm going to read you something. Uh, a study funded by the British Heart Foundation estimated that 3,500 people, apparently healthy adults, die suddenly each year in England without any cause. It found that in around 4% of the deaths, there's no cause whatsoever could be found. Despite a full post-mortem examination, my former karate student, uh, his mother recently passed away and she was barely over 50 years old with no certain cause of death. She had just lost her husband in the year 2010 and her son is only 21 years old and she never could have dreamed he would have no parents at that young of an age. He's an only child. He's by himself now. He has no mom or dad. None of us know if our last day is today so why wait to have assurance of where we're going to go when our last day is here? In the next verse gives us an idea of the spiritual health of the world as a whole. <coughs> Verse 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So it's not just that goes, us go around running, doing things we know are wrong. Sometimes we don't do something we know is good that we should do. That's a sin too. If you, if you see someone fall, you don't help them up sometimes. Like an old lady, she can't get back up, you don't help her. That's a sin. You got to help people when you can. This verse reminds me of the greed of many of the wealthy who care mostly about number one. They care about themselves and only what happens to their own family. We have many people in the world starving without enough food for basic health. Some 795 million people in the world do not have enough food to lead a healthy, active life. That's a lot. That's one out of every nine people in the entire world cannot get enough to be healthy. They're starving. One out of nine people. We have so many rich billionaires and they're letting people starve to death in the streets because they're, they're selfish. They're guilty of a sin of selfishness because all they care about is number one. They care about their own family, but they can let somebody else starve to death over here. As long as they're okay. That's wrong. That's evil. That's sin. Um... I think these verses tell us not to take our lives here on God's green earth for granted because as the scriptures say, tomorrow is promised to no man. In Proverbs 27 it says, Do not boast about tomorrow for you do, you do not know what a day may bring. None of us know if we'll be here tomorrow, right? So why don't we make sure that we're in Christ today? I think He's going to come soon. I, I read the news every time and it surprises me every time how much more scripture is, is coming alive before our eyes. Um, Jesus said when Israel became back into the land in the Old Testament it says Israel would be scattered all over the world but it says near the, back, near the time when I come back the second time there would be an ingathering, a regathering now there's been, there's been Jews from all over the entire world Ethiopia, Russia, all over coming back to Israel more and more and when a certain amount of them comes back and a certain amount of people get saved that's, no one knows when that is but it's soon because God said when Israel came back, when, it, when Jerusalem would be captured, that would be a major sign of my return. So we don't know when that will be, but we know it's soon. We know we're at the end of the end days. No one knows when their last day is or when the end, end day is, but we're near. We want to make sure we're right with God. So I'm going to say a prayer, and I, 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 I pray if anyone doesn't know for sure they're going to heaven, that they would say this prayer with me. Father God, thank you for your sacrifice. For your son's sacrifice. You sacrificed your son. He gave his life willingly. So we could be with him. He suffered on that cross. There was darkness for three hours. 
because you were separated from your father. That was a sign. Even the centurion that didn't know you, the Roman centurion said, this must have been the Son of God when he saw the darkness for three hours upon the whole earth. Lord, we thank you that you gave darkness on this earth three hours to show us that if we accept the life of your Son, we can be with you for eternity. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Help us walk in you. Help us to have a thirst for your word because the word is what the key is. One of your son's names is the word of God. That's why the word of God is alive. That's why it's powerful. That's why it's able to save. That's why it's able to wash away our sins. And your son's death on the cross was the payment, the redeeming factor of our sins. Thank you for redeeming us and I pray that we'd all be ready for your second return, which is coming soon. And we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in the almighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. If anyone said that prayer, I'd like you to let one of our volunteers know so we can pray for you some more. Thank you.